Now, these moods that come to us are things that come on the surface of our being and we tend to live on that surface. They emerge from something much deeper and human beings have the ability of finding out where they come from. And human beings have the ability of transforming themselves and becoming young like that child forever. Dropping things, old habits, dysfunctions that keep you negative, that's death. And nurturing attitudes in life that keep you glowing all the time. That's why we have these courses, the two courses that were mentioned. It's only that. It's our life. Nobody else can do it for us. We have to do it and that's part of the fun. That's part of the journey. Ernest Hemingway said this, every man's life ends in the same way. It is only in the details of how he lived and how he died that distinguish one man from another. I think that's a very powerful line. We are all going from dust to dust. That's, that's, for sure. So I think it's important to see how you're going to die. Hmm? The Gita again, the word uses antakale. <laughs> Are you going to die with joy? Happily? What a wonderful way to live. What a wonderful way to go. And how you die totally depends on how you live. That's why life and death are so linked to each other. How you die depends entirely on how you live. If you live joyously, celebrating life, exploring, discovering, getting enlightened, hmm, you'll go that way, without regrets, with joy. See, in this case, when you terminate your life out of frustration, you're bringing so much pain, not only to yourself, but to all the people who are close to you. Look at those parents. It's painful, you can, I mean. And so much of investment in, in, uh, in life is lost in one impulsive moment. This is for all of us, not for those who commit suicide. This is Dalai Lama telling us, when asked what surprised him most about humanity, he said, man, because he sacrifices his health in order to make money, then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health, and then he's so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present, the result being that he does not live in the present or in the future. He lives as if he is never going to die and then dies having never really lived. It's a pretty harsh, strong statement. In my last self-awareness class, I asked the students, let's say you know when you're going to die, seven days. What will you do? It's a real question. Seven days, that's all you've got. In the Mahabharat, there was a character called Parikshit, the grandson of Arjuna, who knew he had only seven days. You know, the story goes that he was to be bitten by a snake, Takshakan. He never questioned that. He was only concerned about one thing. It's good that I know when I'm going to die. What's the best way to live so that I die happily? <laughs> Very sensible, you know, approach. See, we are all confused in life and in our confusion we do, we do all kinds of things throughout our lives, everybody. We act on impulse, hmm? we act out of fear, sometime out of rash, greed, and we sometimes repent and we want to correct ourselves. 
So we go around in circles, but we never found that true principle, the Sat, to guide us. That's why in the olden days they were very clear that if you're confused and you want to find meaning and direction in life, you better go to someone who's not confused, who's already living that enlightened life. The first year student should not go to the second year student to take advice on whether to bunk class or not. <laughs> and you don't need to go anywhere to give advice. We give freely advice to every Tom, Dick and Harry. Unsolicited advice. You do this, you do that. But before you receive advice, you must check out the guy who is giving you advice. Is he enlightened or is he in the same boat? <laughs> huh? Well, Parikshit said, I'm going to look for the most enlightened guy around who can give me the right advice. The same thing was true in Greece. You know. People asked, they went to the oracle of Delphi to find out Who's the wisest guy so that we go and listen to him? And the oracle of Delphi said, I don't know, but I, I know for sure that that guy lives in Athens and his name is Socrates. So Parikshit got his teacher. And the, you know, you can't, the teacher won't chuman take you. The teacher was Shuka Maharshi and in those seven days, He taught him something which later became a scripture. That's the origin of the Bhagavata Saptaham, seven days. But you need not believe in all these stories. You do it your own way, but surely there are people around us who live very productive, healthy, helpful, meaningful lives and are full of radiance all the time. They're the ones you can tap into and take help to light up the radiance in your own life. Mark Twain, so all these guys visited India. Mark Twain said this beautifully, the fear of death follows the fear of life. A man who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. A man who lives fully. So here's the invitation to you, to all of you. Learn to live fully. Why do we live? It's a deep question. Many people have tried to answer it. I'll give you a, a, the Western answer, which is correct. But let me go back to tradition. In India, the Buddha, for example, see, mind you, we are all potential Buddhas. Buddha was disturbed when he saw death, when he saw suffering. And he was a true scientist philosopher. He said, why? Look at this. We are having a lot of PhD students, they are looking for a problem. Huh? And your only criterion is, you must be able to finish your PhD in three years. And they must be able to publish papers in journals with some impact factor so that it will give you a job later. But those were not the considerations. This was a, a question which stared at him. He said, why? And it's not a local question. It's not a question pertaining to him alone. Why am I suffering? No. Why are we all suffering? You know, nothing can be more universal than that. He was, he was a rebel. He was not a believer. He was a rebel. But he was sure of one thing. And I want you all to feel that inspiration. He was sure that if the question is genuine, it will get answered. And if you follow it, it will be answered. Knock and the door shall open. It said in the Bible, we have to knock. And we have to stay with that question. Wholeheartedly, fully. 
that's how you should do your PhD. <laughs> It'll come, the answer will come. But the question should be well posed. And when he discovered the answer, he also discovered that there was no way he could communicate what he had discovered because guys were living in a completely different world. But he came up with this concept of Trishna, which is easy to understand. Trishna. You know the meaning of the word Trishna? Thirst, yes. He says, everybody is thirsty. But he went on, being a meticulous researcher, he and he, his way of research, the old Indian way of research, which I think is worth pursuing, we have dropped that, is through tapas, tapasya, not by doing, uh, going outward and looking at all the libraries and the internet and all, googling for the answer, but to go inward. Because, remember, the, the source from which we have all come is still there within all of us and you can directly enter. It's called knowledge by identity. So he said there are basically three broad categories of Trishna. The first is called Kama Trishna, desire to acquire something. You're here, sitting here, because you happen to be students in IIT, you're here because you want to acquire a degree. Of course, to the world outside you should say, I'm here to acquire knowledge. But basically you're here to acquire the degree. And we want more degrees, we want wealth, fair enough, we want comforts in life, we want a higher standard of living, we want to do well in life. So all those material things is what drives. We want food. But uh, maybe survival is not a big issue for IIT. We'll all survive happily and get plenty of money, not to worry. But he's not talking about the physical survival, he's talking about the survival of the ego. He's got more than me, that is not good. So that drives me to acquire. Nothing wrong. So we're not making uh, righteous judgments here. It's just a fact, Trishna. The second kind of Trishna is to want to become somebody known, great. We all want that. Hmm? That's another reason you're in IIT. You want the chap, <laughs> the seal. We want to become great. Fair enough. But sometimes we don't become great. Sometimes we don't get what we want. Not sometimes, most of the time. And that's when we get stressed. And when things go really bad, and that's what Arul was talking about. No, we we when we get stressed, we don't receive stress. We don't welcome stress unless you are enlightened. We see stress as something inconvenient, like death. We don't deal with it upfront. It's actually a very simple thing challenging you because you need it for your own growth. We don't receive it and we either tend to suppress it, ignore it, or we take it inside. We don't release it. And we keep ourselves busy with all kinds of things to not deal with it directly. We hide it under our carpet and that does a lot of harm. So intelligent people ask this question as the Buddha did, why? Because if you know why, you'll deal with it up front. There's a very beautiful book which we cover in our course, it's called Creative Stress. 
It's a way of transforming all negativity into positivity by directly looking at what's going on. And you'll find that life becomes an adventure when you see it that way. But we've been trained not to look at it that way. This talk is not about how not to commit suicide. We are talking about living fully. Surviving and living an unenlightened life is not our goal. We want to live fully. Absence of significant disturbances in our life doesn't mean we are living fully. Living fully has a different meaning and that you know only when you live fully. So, when we get sick of life, then when you are fed up with your relationships, and that's happening increasingly, when you want to cut off, when you want to quit your job. Hmm? I have friends in the US who say, you are with that same institution for so long. They say, we have a bad word for that. We say you're institutionalized. <laughs> See, you're supposed to institutionalize has many meanings, like you're in a mental asylum or something. You have to keep changing, man. Make more money, switch jobs, become more famous. But quitting is not dealing with stress. Because you carry the same baggage where you go next. So, Buddha gave a third type of, then you thirst to quit. That he called Vibhava Trishna. So, you've got Kama Trishna, Bhava Trishna, and Vibhava Trishna. You want to end it all. And you could go into depression and you might want to kill yourself. So, that's the reason behind this. But most of us are not like that. We live normal lives. What is normal lives? Normal lives is live not fully, live quarterly, shall we say. <laughs> We're not, not even half-hearted living, we have quarter-hearted living, not good enough. So, uh, someone called Abraham Maslow, you're probably familiar with this, came up with a fantastic theory. Uh, he was not like the other psychologists who were looking at the negative end of the spectrum and see why people are going neurotic, becoming psychopaths. He wanted to look at how do li people live fully? And he did his study on all kinds of people and the first thing he discovered was it has nothing to do with age. You're either like that or you're not like that. And he came up with this theory of self-actualization and the hierarchy of needs. So we all have these needs, physiological needs, safety needs, belongingness, love needs, esteem needs. All of us, without exception. It's shown in a pyramidal form because the majority, the janta is here. Physi physiological needs are body needs which we share with animals. The good thing about animals is they don't think about tomorrow. <laughs> they don't worry. They get what they get and they are happy. We worry, we want to save for tomorrow and day after and seven generations, some people say. Uh, your bank balance has many zeros in it and you are still like a poor guy, greedy to increase it. But all those zeros are not worth a zero, especially when you die. And we want, and th this uh, is a real problem, you know. Our real stress comes from not being loved. In our assignments, the students tell clearly, why did she do that to me? <laughs> I feel I'm not, I'm being left out of a dialogue, conversation. And it hurts, it pinches, because we have such expectations from other people and they don't respond, they don't satisfy our needs. The real problem with life is that. And all these needs are bunched into a category called deficiency needs. 
we are deficient you cannot be full if you die without the deficiency needs being fulfilled you are not going to die happy you may have hajar wealth in your bank balance but it doesn't help you are deficient you have to come to abundance to live fully and to do that you have to cross a threshold and that's where you seek knowledge for the sake of knowledge not for money or marks or degrees and you express life artistically beautifully just the way you are but with a great deal of originality these are being needs you are just being who you are and it's this stage maslow said you become self actualized you realize the potential the child is meant to realize that potential each one of us is unique has a unique potential and then there are meta needs there are higher needs which uh, maslow himself says i don't know and he traveled to india to see he said the rishis here seem to have it at this level you are you have maturity it's which enables people to learn to live to love to relate and play in far more fulfilling ways than normal and that highest need is in the indian language self realization so this is the way to grow but unfortunately the way society moves we have been trained to grow horizontally and increase our deficiencies it's a harsh truth and this is dangerous because this turning point when you grow horizontally is a turning point between need and greed and this is not going to give us the fulfillment we want so, so we need help we need correction we need to be internally aware and say if i really want the fulfillment i want i need to grow vertically i'm grateful to a co-instructor Manoj Pavitran who is at Oroville who gave me this picture and he actually he spoke on this look at this gentleman he died recently wouldn't you say he lived a full life full of joy full of inspiration and he died the same way exactly doing what he loved to do on the podium wonder if it will happen to me now <laughs> look at him look at the things around him very simple life hmm? one veena here a krishna here a nataraj here a buddha there and interesting books and he's reading something here and an even more fantastic book lying on the floor the life divine if you ask me the one book personally that i would recommend which deals with this topic in its entirety it's this one book by sri aurobindo it's called the life divine and this is what he had to say difficulties in your life do not come to destroy you but to help you realize your hidden potential and power so there's a plan there's a reason why your expectations are thwarted there's a reason why you are getting frustrated there's a reason why you are getting stressed that's your kurukshetra abandoning it running away from it is not the way when you look back after you've made the leap in your consciousness you look back with gratitude said if i had not been given that challenge i would not be today where i am so every test in life is calibrated to help us grow it's my personal belief that you will never get a challenge which you cannot handle it's an invitation for you to grow you can avoid it you can run away from it you can distract yourself with other distractions but you're missing the whole point 
And it said so simply and beautifully here. It is to help you realize your hidden potential and power. And power. We are all born with a divine fire in us. Okay. Here is a scientist using a very unscientific term. <laughs> divine fire. We are all born with a divine fire in us and our efforts should be to give wings to this fire and to fill the world with the glow of its goodness. Every day, 24 by 7. And he lived that life. So we need inspiration. That's the one thing we need when you wake up in the morning and the one thing we need to have throughout the day and the one thing we need to give to other people. The word inspiration has the word spirit embedded in it. We need that spirit, not the spirit you consume in the hostel that night. That will take you to tamas. This is the real spirit. That's a pale reflection of the spirit. So we were at Oroville, our group, we make these visits, one full day, where they try to live the life divine. They're far from it, but at least they are trying. And there are some qualities mentioned here which you consciously aspire for. Live with sincerity, with humility, with gratitude, with perseverance, with courage. Keep making progress. Progress where? From tamas to jyoti from asat to sat, from mrityu to amritam, 